You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications button so you're notified for when my next podcast goes live. I've been fighting for 21 years now. So I, went, I turned, pro, well, I'm a first pro fighter when I was 14. So for that just to get taken away from me now, and I'm, I'm 35 now as well, so I feel like I'm coming towards the back end of my career. So I just want to get as many more big fights in as possible. So for that to just be taken away from me and I'm being a little bit lost. I came back home and I said, oh, we've got a real top level fighter coming to England. We need you to fight him. I said, oh, no problem. I'd gone 29 fights unbeaten. I was fucking, I was young, I was cocky, I was fought all bulletproof. They brought his tie over, he'd had 150 fights, never been knocked out. He'd just beaten one of the biggest names in Thailand. But at the time I was just thinking, ah, oh, all right, I'd knocked, I think I'd knocked 20 people out of my 29 wins unbeaten. So I was just thinking, don't matter, I'll stop him, don't matter. Round two, I went bang, left hook, dropped him like a sack of shit. I thought, oh, I'm gonna knock him out. He got up and I'll never forget, he looked across the ring at me. He didn't have a gum shield in, he had blood all over his teeth and he smiled at me and went like that. My last fight, I've I put a, a video up on my Instagram the other day. I'm, I split both my shins horrendously. And that was the only time in a fight I felt I felt it, it really hurt. Mm -hmm. Because I split them both after the fight, went upstairs and the doctor went, oh, don't look at this. And I, I'm like a dick and I looked at it. You could see my bone in my shin. I thought, oh no. Are you scared to retire? I am. I uh, mate, I won't lie to you. I thought about it a few times, and uh, it's, I, don't, I honestly, I worry for my missus because she'll be one looking after me and nurse, <laughs> nursing me back uh, to, to uh, some yeah. sort of like mental, yeah. mental health. Boom, we're on. And today's guest, we've got one of the baddest motherfuckers on this <laughs> planet. Liam Harrison, Mate, how are you, brother? Thank you for having me. I'm very well, thank you. Thanks for coming on. Eight times world Muay Thai champion. Yep. Had over 100 fights. Seen a lot of your fights. You're a bad, bad man. <laughs> um, phenomenal career. How's things? It's good at the minute, mate. Um, I'm lucky enough with all this lockdown shit that's going on to have stuff to keep me busy, but uh, I'm a fighter and I'm missing the, missing the fight side of mm -hmm. everything massively. But I'm hoping to be back in the ring March, April time. But like I said, I've got other stuff to keep me busy at the minute, but there's a there's a hole in my life at the minute that yeah. has just not been filled for the last year and it's it's uh, chipping away at me a little bit, but I'm looking forward to getting back in there. Big void? Massive void, mate. It's um, I've been fighting for 21 years now. So I, went, I turned, pro, well, I'm a first pro fighter when I was 14. So for that just to get taken away from me now, and I'm, I'm 35 now as well, so I feel like I'm coming towards the back end of my career. So I just want to get as many more big fights in as possible. So for that to just be taken away from me and I'm being a little bit lost. But like I said, I've had other stuff to work on. Like me, I've got my clothing company, I've got my YouTube channel, I've got my training website. That's been keeping me busy. But it's like I say, it's a, the fighting yeah. is a, it's a, a drug mm -hmm. that nothing else can yeah. compare but to. But your clothing brand, just plug it straight away at the start. Oh, yeah, this is it. I've got on yeah. now, 11th Commandment. Um, me and my business partner, Clint Gordon, at the beginning of lockdown, we just said, right, let's put his head into doing something different. Obviously, he's uh, he's been doing a bit of acting work and stuff like that. I'm a fighter, so that got taken away from us both. Mm -hmm. So we said, right, why don't we look into doing something like this? Um, we've both got decent followings and... We both know the, the sport industry and that, so let's look at maybe citing us on sportwear, so which yeah. is what we did. Uh, yeah. Which your YouTube channel? Uh, Liam Harrison Training. You've got your own podcast on there? Yeah, I've been interviewing a lot of uh, different fighters and stuff mm -hmm. like that, different Thai boxers, and been opening it up to different uh, boxing, MMA, Muay Thai, and even a few, we had uh, Kevin Sinfield on the other day as well, so I'm opening it up a little bit. Um, I'm enjoying that, yeah, good, it's good. Good, mate, it's good. It's good. Mate, it's like we spoke earlier, this, this is therapy for me, yeah. just talking nonsense basically yeah but people get inspiration from it as well you're a big name out there in the fighting world a lot of people have tagged on your posts and try to get you on but we've been kind of frequently talking for a while so today's the day brother we're yeah. getting about your life so i always go back to the start of my guest brother where you grew up and how it all began um i grew up about five minutes away from where we are now in uh in leeds ls9 bit of a, a rough area um i started in this gym when i was 13 uh i want too mischievous when I was younger. I would, I, I'm lying, I was a little bastard. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I always, I was always getting into fights and stuff at school. I was never a bully or anything like that, but I would always get ended up in uh, in fights and stuff. I used to play football at quite a decent level as well. Um, I played up until decent level until about 17. I trialled at some decent teams when I had scouts watching me from Leeds, Barnsley, Sheffield Wednesday. Um, but that 
got put on the on the back seat to be a football as soon as I walked through the doors here when I was 13. So it was my cousin who brought me down. He just said, oh, why don't you come down and try uh, Thai boxing? Um, be good for your fitness, for football and stuff like that. And it's a bit rough around here. And if you you don't know how to fight around here, you'll get eaten alive. So I thought, oh, you know what? What, I'm going down, a little bit of extra work and stuff. And the first day when I walked in the door here, I think it was about 1999 or 2000, I saw some of the, the guys sparring and I think, fucking hell, that looks, uh, that looks decent. I want to have a go at that. I loved it straight away, but it wasn't until about a month in when I got to spar for the first time and I was like, Fucking hell, this is this is brilliant. And uh, I was only like 13 at the time, but although I'm a midget now, I was, I was quite big when I was 13. I just stopped growing when I was about 14. <laughs> I did. I did. <laughs> um, so I would get into had to spar with like the, the men fighters and stuff like that. And even though I was getting kicked up and down at the gym, I, I just, I loved it. It was amazing. Are you any f fighting blood in the family? <laughs> my, my dad and my granddad were a, a bit uh, rough and ready. Like, um, But uh, my granddad on the other side, he boxed in army a little bit, but I'm like the... The first, well, my cousin brought me down, Andy House, and he's five-time world champion himself. Mm -hmm. um, so he'd started it just before me, and we, we came up together. He's about six years older than me. So we came up together, and we just, whenever he were getting fight at a good level, then I'd be chasing him a bit. Then I might overtake him, yeah. and he'd be that. So it was good having family who were at a competitive level as well, so we're all puff, like yeah. competing against each other. So if he got a bit fitter than me and started beating me up in sparring, I think, shit, I need to fucking up the game a little yeah, bit. Yeah, yeah. So because nice. you matured fast, because you, at 15, you fought a man, is it 28? 28, yeah. How did that come about? Was that allowed? <laughs> no, because what happened was when I started my first fight, pro, yeah. pro, with no padding and stuff like that, well, I got paid for it, I was 14, and we used to lie and say I was 16 because there were no one around my size and as strong as me who were 14 years old because I, I were really big for my weight uh, that age, do you know what I mean? So it was, it was a week before my 15th birthday and I got matched with a guy called Martin Shivnan and he said, oh, we'll say he's 16, he's 16. So he went to the weigh-in and at the weigh-in, I remember him weighing in and then he jumped in his golf GTI and drove himself off. And I thought, he ain't fucking 16. Mm -hmm. um, but he turned out to be 18 and I was 14 and I knocked him out in the first round. So after that, it was just like, there was no way I was going to be able to to go back to fighting anyone around near 14, 15. So we just carried on lying about my age, mm -hmm. saying I was, I was 16. And then I ended up fighting the 28 year old, I think that was my second fight. And I stopped him as well. So by then there was no way I were ever gonna come back to fighting like people around my age. Yeah. I had to just fight grown, grown yeah. men. Who was your coaches and stuff then? Uh, so Richard Smith, I've been with him for the start, the very beginning. He's been my coach for I think, 22 years now I've been training. And did he see the potential in you straight away? Well, yeah, uh, what I was doing is, is I, were, I were here every single night. Um, I used to be the first one here. As soon as I finished school, I'd come to, to come to the gym and I'd always be the last one. I'd be on the bags after the classes ended and stuff, just practicing and trying to get better myself. And I think he, he cottoned on to this and thought, oh, this guy's, he's working hard. Here. And uh, he started to take me under his wing a little bit and doing a bit of extra work with me and stuff. And then eventually he just said, oh, do you want to start coming in the mornings? We'll get some with the other fighters and stuff like that. And this was before I'd had a fight. I said, all right, I'm at school. So what I was doing is some days I was going to school, my dinner hour, I wasn't having no dinner. I was running up here because it's only five minutes away, getting a little session in with other guys, running back to school. And it just, just went from there. So it's saying you just loved it, passion for it to be. <laughs> when did you start? When did you move to Thailand? Uh, that was young as well, was it not? Yeah. So with that, I just, my career, I'd, I'd been fighting mainly Europeans and I'd fought a few Thais who were good fighters, but they want the elite level Bangkok Thais. I'd had about one of my first 29 pro fights unbeaten and um, I'd beat a lot of good Europeans. I'd beat some good ties, but not elite level ties. So I was 18 when I fought my first elite level tie. I'd been to Thailand for three months before this and uh, I'd fought there, but not in like the, the big stadiums because there's two stadiums in Thailand, Lumpini mm -hmm. and Rajaram Nern. These are where all the elite guys go to fight. Um, so I'd fought some decent level fighters, but not the elite. When I were 18, I just got back from my first stint in Thailand. I went there for three months and I didn't get to, the chance to fight there. I fought in Japan. So I flew from Thailand to Japan and I knocked a guy out in round two. But when I knocked him out, I broke my hand. So I had to go back to Thailand for like a month and I didn't get the chance to fight, which is what I wanted to do. I wanted to fight in the main stadiums. I came back home and I said, oh, we've got a real top level fighter coming to England. We need you to fight him. I said, oh, no problem. I'd gone 29 fights unbeaten. I was fucking, I was young, I was cocky. I was fought bulletproof. 
They brought this tie over. He'd had 150 fights, never been knocked out. He'd just beaten one of the biggest names in Thailand. But at the time, I was thinking, ah, no, I, I'd not, I think I'd knocked 20 people out of my 29 wins unbeaten. So I was thinking, don't matter, I'll stop him, don't matter. Round two, I went bang, left hook, dropped him like a sack of shit. I thought, oh, I'm going to knock him out. He got up and I'll never forget, he looked across the ring at me. He didn't have a gum shield in, he had blood all over his teeth and he smiled at me and went like that. I thought, <laughs> That's never happened before. Mm. I thought he'd usually stay down. Yeah. Mate, he got up and he fucking destroyed me. He battered me. With an, he, honestly, it was horrendous. Round three, four and five, because it's a five round fight. He absolutely wiped the floor with me. And like the beating I took in that fight, I mean, I, I showed good art and I lasted to the end. I mean, I don't think anyone would have like batted an eyelid if it, if it had stopped me because he hit me with some disgusting shots. I remember after the fight, I, I couldn't walk. I was pissing blood from where he'd been kneeing me so hard around my kidneys and stuff like that. I felt like I'd been in a, a proper car mm. crash. And after that, I thought, right, if this is how good these guys are at this elite level, I can either stay here and pad my record out fighting the Europeans. I can probably get to 50 fights and I, I might not have lost. Or I can go over there, learn how to fight how they fight, mix that with how I fight, live in the gym, do what they do, train how they do, and then I'll be able to, to mix it with them at that yeah. level. Who was it with your first loss? It was tough because, like I said, it were, um, I fought a bulletproof and I had a lot of knockouts. I'd fought at a good level. I'd fought some good fighters, but not the, the best fighters. And um, yeah, it was tough. To, it were a tough pill to swallow because I had a quite a big following at that time. I'd got a bit of momentum behind me. Everyone was saying, oh, yeah, he's going to be the next big thing and this. And then when that happened, especially going into the elite level. And I, I questioned myself a lot, thinking, fucking hell, is that how it is at this level? Is this what it's like? Am I good enough at this level? And it was like a bit of a, a back and forth battle. It was really like, mm -hmm. what are you going to do about it? You're going to get you sent to Thailand, learn how to do it, how they do it, stay in the gym with them. And at first, when I got there, it was fucking awful because I said to the, the coach, I trained at a gym called Jitty Gym, um, and I'd been there for three months before. But when I came back, I said, treat me how you treat there was some top level stadium ties there. I said treat me how you treat them I said I want to do what they do so it were every morning I were on a mattress on the floor with them just living in the gym like they did every morning getting poked with a stick get up go run come back and the worst thing about it the, the start was a foreigner in their gym all they wanted to do was just fucking beat me up every yeah, single day yeah. this the foreigner here he's pretty talented he's good but you fucking need to put him in his place mm -hmm. so what they were doing is on the mornings we were getting up and you got to do 10k run around the park. I was going to the park with them. I was running round and I was watching most of these get a bottle of water, pour it on the red, walk back to the gym like they'd run. So when I'm getting back to the gym, I'm already tired from the run. They weren't tired at all and they were just fucking kicking shit out of me yeah. and sparring and clinching yeah. and stuff like that. So that was tough. But about two or three months in when I'd had a few fights, I had a few knockout wins and I started to win the respect a little bit of them then. So they, they eased up with that, that mm -hmm. type of stuff there. Yeah. How was the different? How was the different training from UK to then go to Thailand? Is it total night and day? Yeah, I'd never experienced how it how it was until I actually went there and did it. It was a shock to the system, like the heat, the three hour session in the evening, a two hour session in the morning. Like I say, over here, I do maybe an hour in the morning and then two or three hours in the night. But in that heat, even the run, the ten k run there would just fucking wiping wiping me out at the start of it the heat all the other amazing top level fighters just how they do everything it was just a complete shock to the system so the afternoon session will be sorry the morning session first get up 10k run you come back you do a little bit of bag work maybe a little bit of pads not too hard bit of clinch work or a bit of light sparring afternoon you either skip for 30 minutes to warm up or go run and do a 5k run to warm up come back then you've got seven or eight rounds on the pads, hard rounds, straight into sparring, straight into clinch work, straight onto the bag, straight onto some conditioning. And this is six days a week, every day, you didn't never get in a day off. And it were, uh, they try and break you to be fair. And uh, that was that was tough. And there were a few times in that I questioned myself a little bit thinking, am I doing the right thing here? What the fuck am I doing? Yeah. Do you know what I mean? It were, it were, Do you get paid for that? Just your fights? Just to fight. So I went out there, I saved a little bit of money from my fights that I'd had in England, but I was only 18, 19, so I didn't have much money at the time. So it were either fight regular and keep the money coming in or go back home. Yeah. So what happened was after about six months, I got sick of being in the gym. I got sick of my mattress on the floor and stuff like that. I just fucking couldn't do it anymore. So 
I got a little apartment next to the gym and I had to pay rent on it. And uh, that's when it came down to basically fighting for to, to stay there. If I couldn't fight to pay the rent, now I had to go back home. So I had to keep fighting regular. I had to keep my body strong. I had to stay fit and I had to stay ready. How was your family thinking when you decided to take the leap over there? So it was not many British fighters went over there and trained then? Not at that time, mm -hmm. no. Um, my mum and dad have all been really supportive. I, uh, even when, like, when I were in school and stuff, I, I was walking around school and I was paying no attention because all I was thinking about in my head was my next fight. And uh, my dad's always really fucking supported me, like massively. He, I fought in Japan when I was 17 and my dad flew out there with me and he came with me. So uh, my mum's been the same, to be fair. So they massively supported me. Um, I remember when I went to live in Thailand, though, when I moved, I was seeing a girl, a girl here. I've been with her for about three years. And um, when I realised how much I needed to get out there and train with these guys to compete at their level, I just went, right, I'm off to live in Thailand. I'm sorry. Yeah. Three years. Priorities. Yeah, yeah I, did, I did. And uh, I feel a bit bad about it now mm. when I look back about it and think on it because I literally did just go, I'm off to live in Thailand, yeah. I'm sorry, and left. Yeah. Um, so how did you end up a man becoming one of the best fighters in Muay Thai, eight world championships? How did that come about? When was the first one you won? So it was just before I went to live in Thailand, I won my, my first one. Um, that were under kickboxing rules, K1 style rules. Mm -hmm. And I took it on three weeks notice. Uh, I fought a guy from Italy. Yeah, we're Italy. Naples, it was. I went to Naples. So I took it on three weeks notice and I went out there and this, this, they didn't have to try and fuck me around. So I got out there, 19 year old, weighing, I wanted to be 62 kilo, I had to be. They had all TV there and everything. It was like a big deal for Italy. I jumped on scales, 62 kilo, bang on. They go, oh, your opponent will be here in an hour. He's late, he's in traffic. So I went away. I had steak, I had pasta, I had rice. I had two litres of water, filled myself back up. I had a big, massive bar of chocolate. Not the best fucking diet after it. I weighed mm -hmm. in, but I was only young. So I had a big, massive bar of chocolate. I proper gorged myself. Opponent turns up, jumped on the scales, 64 kilos. I went, no, I said, well, tight, I thought you need to be bang on weight. I said, go and lose weight. And I went, no, you can't lose weight. It'll look bad for TV. I don't give a fuck if it looks bad for TV. I said, I've just weighed in at 62 kilos. Yeah. Get him on weight. I said, it's a world title. You have to weigh him. Bang on. I went, you jump back on the scales. I said, I'm going to be fucking heavy. I said, I've just eaten. I went, well, if you're heavy, he's, you're going to be the same as him. <laughs> I said, I've just weighed in at 62. <laughs> uh -huh. And I was fucking arguing with him for ages and so with my boss and stuff. And eventually I just went, you know what? Fuck it. I said, I don't care. Mm -hmm. And uh, came back next day. And I looked at him across the ring and I thought, why the fuck didn't I make him lose weight? I said, he's massive. And um, I think I'd had. I'd only had 23 fights at the time and he had 70. And I'm thinking, why the fuck didn't I just make him lose weight? And I remember the first time he hit me and it wobbled me bad. And I thought, shit, I've never been hit this hard. And I kept kicking his leg and kicking his leg and kicking his leg. And in round four, eventually he just turned his back and turned away. And I thought, oh, I've stopped him. So I like looked at the ref for the ref to stop it. And the ref didn't do all. So I fucking ran across the ring and I booted him straight up his ass. All crowd started booing. They all started throwing bottles in the ring and everything. Mm. I thought, oh shit. I thought, am I going to get disqualified here? Yeah. So Bell went and I was stood in the middle of the ring. I went to the ref and raised my hand. I stopped him. And he went, oh no, no. He went around talking to all the judges. I thought, I'm going to get fucking done here. But eventually they, they raised my mm -hmm. hand and that was How my first one. How was it then? So I, I used to love the film Kickboxer. See, your shins must be solid. Was that a myth when they kicked trees over there or? You'll see videos of them kicking the bamboo trees. Yeah, is that fake? Yeah, all you need to do to condition your, sing, yeah. your shins is kick the pads, kick the heavy bag. Like, the bags in Thailand, mm -hmm. yeah, they're full of sand and shit like that. Mm -hmm. The fucking rock hard. You don't need to be kicking anything else other than, other than yeah. that. Yeah. How, for people that's just uh, maybe seen a couple of fights but don't know the rules of Muay Thai, is it two minute breaks when after each round? So, in Thailand, you'll get five rounds, three minutes, two minute break. In Europe, you'll either have a minute or a minute and a half, usually. Because mm -hmm. um, over here, like the, it's not a big gambling culture and stuff like that. The, the two-minute break over there is for the gamblers in the crowd. So the fighters can get all their energy back, and then it's going to be like a close, even fight again. Like over here, we don't have that. So maybe you'll get a minute rest or a minute yeah. and a half. I thought I'd have loved that over there, mate. If it was time to gamble, mate. <laughs> <laughs> when I were out there, um, I, I put this little clip on my, my Instagram the day. What I did while betting on myself for mm -hmm. extra money. And sometimes this were that were really good and I'd fucking win a yeah. bit of extra cash on myself. But there were a time I was fighting at Roger Amnern, one of the biggest stadiums in the world, massive fight. How many people are you talking in these stadiums? Um, there'll be a couple of thousand in there, but when the couple of thousand gamblers are all in there, the atmosphere- Screaming, is, shouting. Oh, it's, 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 it's unbelievable. Like yeah. the first time I ever saw it, I was like, fucking hell, this is, mm -hmm. this is amazing. 
But yeah, I'd, I'd bet on myself and the whole gym had bet on me. And uh, he said, do you want to bet on yourself? I went, yeah, fuck it, I want to bet on myself. And this were a rematch. The guy had beat me already, but I was sure, I was so sure I was going to beat him. And in round, I bet all my rent money and everything, all my purse money. I said, bet it all. I said, I'm going to knock him out. And round three, I went, bang, left hook, wobbled him. He was gone out on his feet. I ran in to finish him off and he fucking need me as I threw a punch. So I'm breathing mm -hmm. out and I went, bang. And I went, oh no, no, I fucked. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I was trying to hit him and all my power had just gone. I sat down at the end of round three and all ties went, why, why don't you finish him? You had him then? I went, I'm fucked. Uh -huh. <laughs> I said, I'm fucked. How many broken bones have you had? Um... Quite a few. Have but you? I've been looking at being that in, never had that many bad injuries. Because it looks more extreme than obviously boxing because you've got the gloves, but UFC and stuff, it looks ruthless, a ruthless sport. Did you ever think about taking the leap to UFC? A lot of people ask me about this and uh, said, why, why have you never done no ground? Never, why have you never gone, done no ground? But I've always been so obsessed with Muay Thai that I've never wanted to do anything else. I've, I said to you before, didn't I? I said, I think you can only be good at something if you love it. Yeah. And I, I've I never like really loved the wrestling or the groundwork yeah. or, or anything like that. Because John like Jones, that. I know he's Muay Thai and Dan Tull, who's a good friend Yeah, of he's a good How friend How long have you known Dan for? Uh, uh, about, since he was about, no, about 15. Yeah. Dan, yeah, we've had a few fucking dust-ups in here. <laughs> when he was a little bit bigger, yeah. I slapped him around. But uh, fucking, I reckon if he got hold of me now, yeah. he'd just be, he'd be like, when Hulk grabs yeah. Loki in Avengers, he just smacked me around. Yeah, I love Dan, man. He's <laughs> just a good, good lad, mate. Fucking nutcase, just yeah. a good guy. Just... He's the exact same guy you now he is when he was 15 yeah. as well. Yeah, but, um, uh, He'll be world champion. I think he should take the leap. And he was talking about going to Dubai. I think that'd be good for him, I think. And Liverpool, it's difficult in your home city, especially when you're, such a high celebrity now and everybody's want a piece of you and he's the kind of guy where he's too easy fucking leg he is, tell you that he is, if he got and got, put himself in Dubai where he's just only training and that mm. mate he'll be a fucking a in that yeah. condition yeah. he's already an animal yeah. but he just needs that little bit of extra push and he'll mm -hmm. be How was you were on the Joe Rogan show and you were training with Joe Rogan people they see that he could compete he's that good at his kicks and fighting how was he training with I couldn't believe it when he fucking I put the pads on and he kicked him I literally could not believe how hard he kicked me but what you don't realise is he's only about my height but he's about 95 kilos of just fucking solid muscle so when he, I put the pads on and the first kick it fucking rattled from my feet all the way up to my head and I was like oh my god and uh, yeah he's um, he's very very powerful he's, he's unpredictable how fucking hard he can kick them pads yeah. but he's done Taekwondo for years, he's a black belt in Jiu Jitsu. He openly says he won't pass a piss test. And so, you know what I mean? Yeah, so he's yeah, a, a yeah. solid, solid guy. Mm -hmm. So he takes stuff. He, he openly says on his yeah. podcast, he said, I won't pass a piss test. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think he's talked about doing growth and, and shot a test and stuff before. And yeah. That. So, yeah, he, open, he openly admits it. So. He looks a machine. Mate, he's so strong. He's in his 50s very, anyway. Very strong. Yeah, but, but he smokes the weed and drinks. Exactly. Do you know what I mean? I think a lot. Of, I think Big John Jones drinks, uh, smokes a lot of fucking weed as well. A lot of them American, like yeah. the Diaz brothers and people like that. Um, it's some. You know, when I have ever done it, it'll be to, when I go to yoga, and it was because Joe, Joe Rogan said to me, he said, "When you go to hot yoga in the hot room, get stoned before." And he said, "You can feel like every fiber in your your body stretching." So that's the only time I'd done it. These guys do it and then go training. I couldn't do that. Yeah, no, I was too lazy. Yeah, yeah. fucker, man. But yeah, it's um, you've met some characters as well through your career. Eh? Mm. If you looking back and you like you says before, you you think you're coming to the end. What would you do without it? Well, I think I've got about. How long do you think you've got I, left I in think you? I've got another three year left in me. Yeah. I'm 35, but I still feel strong and fit. I'm on a good winning streak at the minute. How many fights? Um, I've won six in my last seven at the minute, and I'm still fighting at the best level there is. So I'm still up there with the top guys. The only fight that I lost was against... Is that the Battle of Britain kind of one? Uh, no, that were... Um, it were a tie called Rodlek over in Shanghai. And he's just fought for the title at my weight division. So he's obviously like elite. So mm. I'm still up there. Not a really close fight I had with him. So yeah, I, th I think three more years left. I don't want to go to the point where I'm past it and everyone's going, what's he doing still fighting? Yeah. Because too many guys do that. Do you know if, how's your speed and stuff now? Do you, do I feel faster yeah. than ever still. Um, I understand my body better. I know when to have a rest. I know not to to push myself into the ground and run myself into the ground and mm -hmm. stuff like that. I understand my body better than ever at the minute. Um, but it's been a bit of a struggle getting back my speed back to after I've been so long off in lockdown and that. But I'm getting back there. And yeah. I, yeah, my body feels good again. Who was the guy you were on Joe Rogan with? The, the hypnotherapist or something? Or um, who, Who's he? So you seem Vinnie to be tight with him. You see a lot of videos with him. Yeah, so that's Vinny Shawman. Me and him have been friends for about 
must be going on 20 years now. And he's always been involved in Thai boxing. He had his own gym and stuff like that. So I've known him through that. He started doing the hypnotherapy about 15 years ago, I think. And I never believed in it. And he used to say, do you want to do a bit of work? Do you want to do a bit? And I could see he's like getting bigger and better and some working with famous people and stuff like that. And I said, oh, I don't think I need it. I don't think I need it. I've always thought I was mentally strong. I've always believed that I don't need any extra help. And he said, do you want to do it? Do you want to do it? And I said, no. And I fought a tie called Anawa in Jamaica about 2009. He was the most prolific puncher, uh, I think probably in the last 25 years, massive, massive KO ratio. And I thought, oh, it's all right, don't matter, I'll beat him. Fought him in Jamaica, got smashed to fucking pieces. And it was the first time I'd ever been stopped. And again, coming back to like the first time I ever lost, I was like, well, fuck me, what happened then? Like that's never happened before. And again, it were a battle trying to fucking overcome, thinking, am I, oh, that it? Am, I is, am I not good enough? Am I, am I this, am I that? Am I, not, am I not as good as I think? A bit of a mental battle going on in my head. And I begged the promoters over here. I said, bring him to England, please. I said, I know I can beat him. So I brought him to England and I fought him at the MEN arena. And Vinny said, do you want to do a little bit of work? And I thought, you know what? There's no point, no harm in trying to get my mind as strong as my body. And I did some work with him and it's, it's so hard to explain because it'll be different for everyone. But what he did for me, he like instilled a word into my head, the word with warrior. And he said to my coach in between the rounds, call him a warrior, call him a warrior. And I were in some sort of fucking weird state of mind that I've never been in ever before. It were, it's hard to explain, but if you watch the fight, you see me at the end of the fight, I schooled, schooled the tie. MEN Arena, thousands of people there. My biggest one in my career by a mile still is to this day. My dad's birthday and... I jumped on the ropes afterwards and I said to Vinny, because he was commentating, and I said, thank you, mate. And it's, uh, I'll never forget that. I went to the after party, still buzzing, passed out, ambulance, hospital all night, I had a really bad concussion. And I didn't even feel it in the fight, no, anything didn't feel rocked, didn't feel hurt at any point. And after getting smashed to bits like I did in the first fight, and then to be in a, a mind state that I was in the second where nothing hurt, but then I still ended up in hospital, that were a testament to how good he is at what he mm -hmm. did and how good we gelled together. That's mad, eh? mm, Yeah. Like I said, I didn't a... fucking believe it. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. How was it, how was it, like, paramedics and stuff over there? Because obviously you hear people, like, after a fight, they just get left outside. Is that true as well? I've got a fucking story where that happened, but this were in China. Yeah. I fought in um, <laughs> a place called Zheng, Zhengzhou, I think it was called, in China. And I fought a Thai champion. First round, it was only a three-round fight, so I thought, I'm going to have to go for this. First round, I jumped in to fucking try and knock him out and he elbowed me, fractured my eye socket, dropped me for an eight count and jumped back up and thought, fuck me. I'm only about 30 seconds into the fight and my eye, my arm and face were numb and I thought, fucking hell, that were horrible. Finished the fight, I lost on points because of the knockdown. Three round fight, it was too, too far to get it back for that. Took me straight outside, had a big, big cut under my eye. He'd cut me on my head as well. He took me outside and just shut the door and left me outside, it were fucking roasting. I'd struggled to make the weight as well. So I were a bit dehydrated. Left me out there and I thought, oh, doctor must be coming around in ambulance or something. There were two big fences at either side. I had my gloves on still, so I couldn't jump over them. And they left me out there for about an hour and a half and I thought I would fucking die in at first. What? And I was thinking, what is going on here? And I only fucking got back in the building mm -hmm. because my trainer came and looking for me. And he came and he found me, he took me inside and then they stitched me up. I'm like, what the fuck are you doing? Left me outside. And I went, oh no, ambulance should have come and got mm -hmm. you. I said, no one came and got me. He yeah. fucking left me there. How are you treated over in Thailand and stuff in Japan being a British fighter? Do you get more respect over there? Well, is it? No, it's okay. Um, do you get more respect or is it hard because you're not one of their own? Japan is a, it's a, a weird place to fight. They all just sit in, in silence. So like in Thailand, you've got all the gamblers going absolutely fucking mental. Japan, they sit in silence. So like, it, it's weird. Like it's, deadly, yeah. it's deathly silent. <laughs> you may as well just have no crowd there. It's a, a weird experience fighting there. But in Thailand, that's what I wanted. I wanted the respect of the gamblers, I wanted the respect of all the promoters, and I wanted the respect of the, the top level fighters there. And um, in the two years I was there, I had some good fights, I fought some of the top ranked guys, I had some good wins, uh, I had some good good fights even when I lost. And that's the thing there, as long as you fight hard, you show heart, and you give a good fight, whether it's you lose by a bit or even you win by a bit, the gamblers love that. If you're fighting close fights, they love it. Or if you're, my, my style is power, I go to try and 
knock out every fight. Mm -hmm. They enjoy that. As long as you've got a good heart, they'll they'll warm to you and you'll you'll get the respect. Yeah. So you've had over a hundred fights. That's a lot of fights. A lot of fights. And that's not including all the sparring and shit you've mm. done. What's the sparring like over there? Is it just like a fight with some of the Thai fighters? Sometimes, like I said, then like when you're a Westerner in their gym with them, they fucking they want to prove a point. It's their mm. gyms. They live there, and you're like a an imposter. Yeah. And they want to prove that you're an imposter, but you've got to prove that you belong there. And um, like I said at the at the first, they were fucking always trying to put it on me, just trying to break me, trying to bully me a little bit. But then like once I got used to the heat. I've started to make a name for myself. My confidence was going up. I was obviously improving because I'm sparring with these guys. I'm working with all these trainers. It started to even itself out a bit and eased off a little bit then. But the sparring usually over there, when you're kicking and stuff, it's nice and light. It's technique sparring and play sparring. You'd be doing it fast, but you weren't hurting each other. But then when you do the boxing sparring, you get the big gloves on the head guards. That's just a fight. Yeah, because you look at UFC now, um, boxing. Boxing's always been an elite, but I think UFC's... If, on par if not just do you know, why, do you know why I believe that's it? taken over because the best fight the best and the fucking boxing's avoiding everyone yeah, it's money. you can go 25 fights some beating and you won't have fought another top ranked fighter yeah. UFC now it's just like he's the best he's the best get in there see, Let's I see. like that there's only one belt as well exactly there's only one belt with boxing you've got four, five, six belts some divisions but that's why fucking we haven't seen like Joshua versus Fury yet or other fights and that because they're fucking too busy defending other belts yeah. and stuff like that too much money involved why do you think uh, Muay Thai hasn't got moved up the ranks as fast as UFC even though everybody loves combat sports mm. and that is one of the most ruthless if not the most ruthless out of everything it's a lot more now it's a lot bigger now there's a what they've done is they've won championship have come along they've took tie boxing they've put the best fighters in the world in MMA gloves and they've changed the rules a little bit so it's a bit more fan friendly there's no like um, no da traditional dance. Before what was the dance ever. at the start called? It's called your your Y crew or your Ramui, just like paying respect to your teachers and stuff like that. But a lot of people over here, when fighters start doing it before the fight, they don't want to see that. They want to mm. see a fight. So like a lot of my friends who are paying money for a ticket, they don't really appreciate it. They don't like it, and they just think, what the what the fuck's this? Get in there and just fight. That's what we want to see. Mm -hmm. So a lot of promoters over here now they're cutting that out. But this one championship, what they've done is they've put all the best fighters in the world in MMA gloves. When you've got our, our good stand-up strikers in, in Muay Thai, are, they are the best. If you put them in MMA gloves, a lot of a lot of knockouts are going to happen. So that's what they're trying to do now. They're pushing it more to like the, so it's going to be more fan friendly, smaller gloves, shorter rounds, more explosive. If we'd have done this a, a few years ago, it, I think it would be up there with yeah. MMA now. But it is slowly getting there. Mm -hmm. It's just a shame. Yeah, I'm coming to the back end. Well, I've, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I've still yeah, got a few years. Mate. Yeah, I've still got a few Have left you ever seen anybody being killed in the ring? In Muay, Muay Thai, Thai, no, no, not in Muay Thai. I've seen some horrendous KOs from elbows and head kicks and stuff like that, but I've never actually seen anyone lose a life. I've never even heard of it. To be, oh, I've heard of it once in Thailand. A lot of disqualifications, isn't it? <laughs> Do you know what? Some Jeez, sorry, you're chatting. It's because it's fucking freezing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I am. I'm cold. <laughs> yeah. um, there's a lot of. There is sometimes because none of the rule set. Mm -hmm. There's a certain rule called a continuous movement. So if say if I catch someone's kick, I sweep him onto the floor. As he's falling, even if his hands touch the floor and I kick him in the face, that's legal as long as I've done it continuously. But you'll get some fighters who'll sweep stop give it a second then kick him in the face yeah and then that's where a bit of controversy comes in because mm -hmm. then were, he, were he continuous were it not continuous do you know what i mean yeah. yeah is there a lot of corruption in muay thai same as boxing's corrupt as fuck in thailand with the gambling yeah. there is yeah and you'll there's a lot of people taking dives yeah and if what happens sometimes in the thailand you'll see if it's on tv and stuff like that the referee will just stop the fight and send both the fighters from the ring and that'll be if he thinks someone's took a bribe here and if it's not going to have a proper fight for the, the gamblers and stuff like that so you see stuff like that happening so all the time so the refs have got a say yeah 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 you'll see fighters who get drugged before the fights and sometimes end up in hospital and stuff like that no because it's always the gamblers trying to get like a, a step ahead and stuff like that so there's a lot yeah. of stuff like that goes on yeah happens? yeah it's rife that's it's bad rife yeah, yeah yeah so how can how did you end up winning eight titles did you ever dream of that to be the world's greatest at Muay Thai and won world titles no um I always used to set out small goals at a time. So the first title I won were like a, a Northern area title. Then after that, I wanted to win a British, then a Commonwealth, I wanted to do it that way. But what happened was I won the Northern area title after about six fights. And then I didn't fight for any other titles, even though I was going through the ranks and I wasn't fighting for any titles, but I was still fighting champions from France, Spain, Italy, 
all around Europe, started fighting ties. And I was fighting ties and I'd still not even won any, like a British title or all like that. I, it was like I'd surpassed it all without fighting for it. And then my next fight after that, a world title fight. So like I said, I didn't get the chance to fight for these titles. I just jumped straight to, from area in English, got me sent ranked number one in England and then went straight to the, the world mm -hmm. titles. And then I think I won my second one were in Thailand and that was massive. I, that were on live on Thai TV. A lot of gamblers there. I fought the current champion and that were that were probably one of my, my, yeah. my most favourite memories. You yeah. gambled on, I know you've gambled on yourself before, but were you doing it a lot just to get by and get some food and pay for your rent? Yeah, most most fights, yeah. So if you lose, you're fucked? Well, like I did, I lost, like that fight I was talking about before where I, I bet all my money on myself, I know mm. Jim bet on me, I lost the fight. I had to go fight again three days later to get some rent money. So the, the, the gym owner, he said to me, he said, Liam, like, you've got no money, what are you going to do? I went, I need to fight again. I was fucked as well, James, honestly. Mm -hmm. My shins were in absolute <laughs> bits. I was just in agony. Yeah. And I thought, oh my God, I don't want to do this. But we flew from Bangkok to Phuket and Phuket, the fighters aren't that strong. The, like the Bangkok guys are fucking machines, Terminators. Phuket, they're good fighters, but they're not top yeah. level. So I went down there, I fought... I knocked him out in round three, luckily, because I remember I kicked him in round one. And when you got the adrenaline in your fight, you don't feel anything. I kicked him in round one and I thought, fuck me, that hurt because my shins yeah. were just battered from the last fight. Do you ever feel anything in your shins anymore when you're kicking? Or do you still feel some sort of pain? <laughs> you, it's weird. It's like something triggers in your head and that it's like says, that's going to hurt after. But like, not at the time, not really. My last fight, I've I put a, a video up on my Instagram the other day. I'm, I split both my shins horrendously. And that was the only time in a fight I felt I felt it it really hurt mm -hmm. because I split them both after the fight went upstairs and doctor went oh don't look at this and I, I like a dick and I looked at it could see my bone in my shin I thought oh no yeah so how does that what how do you get back from injuries so fast <sighs> do you know what I never understood how to look after my body when I was younger but like now I do a lot of cold cryotherapy stuff like that I eat healthier um hot yoga Obviously, the older you get, the more prone you are to, to picking these injuries up. So all through my 20s, I didn't really do anything to recover afterwards because I was just getting away with it. I was eating what yeah. I wanted. I would, I wasn't stretching. I wasn't doing anything. I was just having my fights. I was training hard and then my body was just recovering itself. Mm -hmm. As soon as I hit 30, that went straight out the fucking window. Yeah, as soon as I hit 30, mate, I was just like fucking walking around like an OAP after training yeah. and stuff. And I'm thinking, shit, what is going on here? So I started to like learn about my body a bit more. I started doing stuff like hot yoga, more stretching, better diet, cold therapy, cryotherapy. Yeah. Because yeah. the hot yoga, that's what I, it was actually, we were speaking earlier, Sean Wright from yeah. the Grip House in Glasgow put his me on the hot yoga. Yeah. And um some killers in that gym as well, Grip House. Yeah, I mean, good, good gym. Speaking of with Jojo Calderwood, yep. I think she's in America doing the UFC. Yes, is it a small community? Like the, the Muay Thai gyms, like, the, the, the boys in them are so nice. And when we we're speaking earlier, like I know a lot of loud people, people pretend they can fight and they're always loud and think they can do this. But you see these boys and you wouldn't think anything but they're proper fucking killers. Is it a, a small community around? The UK has a lot of gyms open there's a, now. There is a lot of gyms. It is quite a big community, but we all do know each other and stuff as well. It is like um, like every single gym knows every every other gym. And uh, like you say, there's a lot. The, the talent pool here now in England is huge. There's some of the best fighters in the world, I believe, in England now. But like you said, they're all quiet, unassuming, yeah. nice, down-to-earth guys and stuff. There's no real dickheads. or And there's no like trash talk and stuff like in Muay Thai, really. Because, again, it's like the best just fight the best. And you don't really have to do because your talking in the gym. Yeah, do your doc, talking in the ring. Yeah, and there's because it's not like a massive TV and stuff like that. There's no need for all this trash talk and stuff because you're not trying to yeah. sell the fight to anyone. It's like everyone in, in Muay Thai, they already know the best and they already know what's what. So you don't have to try and sell it. The best fight, the best, and then that just that's just who's that. the up and coming England? Would you say uh, there's a kid called Jonathan Haggerty. He's uh, twenty. 22 and he's just bounced onto the scene and he's fighting with all the best ties he's on one championship and he's fucking like really really how does that make you feel do you feel as if okay i'll show you does, you, you, does that fight um excite you a young kid coming through up and coming does that remind you of yourself a bit that willing to fight anyone yeah mate 100 uh, percent. There's, there's quite a few like that as well but he's like the one who's just he's the, the only one at the minute who's bounced onto like the the elite level um 
and he's fucking in there like with the best the best of the best now so like in England now I'd probably say there's me and him at the at the same level and he sometimes he jokes and says he's coming for me and stuff like that but I'll be always be ready <laughs> I'll always be ready mate <laughs> that would be a good fight then yeah yeah he's, he's the weight a few divi- more fights he's, couple of years he's the weight division below me but mm. um yeah, maybe, maybe. How many different weight divisions have you fought in? So I've won my world titles from lightweight, light welterweight, and a welterweight. So I'm free, free weight world titles. Free weights, yeah, would you yeah. Up again? Do you know what? I've done stupid shit like that before. I did it against the the one championship champion of the world is a Thai called Pech Morakot, and I f- took a fight against him on two weeks' notice at seventy kilos. And I was fucking lighting him up big time. And then in round two, mate, he hit him with an elbow and just fucking floored me. Yeah. The way I'm, I'm, my last fight were at light welterweight, which is 140 pounds, 63 kilos. This fight were at 70 kilos. So that extra, it's a stone. Mm-hmm. So when he hit me with that elbow, I went down, I got up and beat the count, but the ref waved it off. And, uh, I thought to myself at the time, I thought, no, fucking stupid yeah. idea, though. It was a stupid yeah. idea. Is there a certain number in your mind, Tom? How many fights you had, had all in? 120 odds? 106. No, 100, yeah, 116 ish. 116. Is there a certain number in your mind where you go, okay, I'll have 140, one, maybe hit 150? How many fights can you do in a year? Do you know what? When I was younger, I was doing about 10 fights a year, no problem. But like now, with the injuries and, and stuff like that, it's the fight camps that take it out more out of me now than the actual fight itself because when you're training that hard it was, I was just doing it non-stop when I was younger and then I'd fight a few days off back in the gym fight again three weeks later I wasn't picking up injuries when I fight now the way I fight as well because I'm fucking always trying to KO everything I throw is full power um I might fight now and I'm going to have to need a month off afterwards. I'm just uh, fucking laid in a bucket uh-huh. of ice I reckon I can still do four or five fights a year now. another world title I'd love, I'd love to fight for the the one one championship world title. Mm-hmm. Um, that is like the the pinnacle at the minute. That's where all the money is. That's where all the people, who, all the top fighters are. It's a massive audience. Um, yeah, I'd, 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 yeah, I think I need one more big win, and then there's a possibility that I could fight for that title. That's what I want to chase. But uh, got yeah. to chase something. You yes. obviously know what you're doing. You've won that many fucking world yeah, titles. Yeah. Josh Warrington as well, you know Josh. Yeah, good friend, Josh. Good Another friend. world title contender. Oh, not contender. He's won. T- he's won the belt now. He's a world title. He's a world champion. champion of the world. Yeah, amazing. I love Josh to bits. Very underrated. I always say it. I don't. I think he's he's now this year. He'll go right through the ranks, Josh. I think once he goes to America and stuff, he'll become the superstar that he deserves to be. He's an absolute animal. I interviewed Carol Frampton yesterday, and he says. He, he, he was surprised at his punching power. Well, in that first round, we talked about it oh. earlier, didn't we? Because I went to that fight and I couldn't fucking believe it because everyone had wrote Josh off against Selby. He did a job on Selby. Mm. Everyone wrote him off against Frampton. First round, mate, he f- rocked him right yeah. to his boots, didn't mm-hmm. he? Came out like a bull. How, was, how do you get celebrated down here? Have you got a good support? I have, actually. Yeah, I have. Um, whenever I fight in England, I always take quite a few, a few, few guys with me and stuff like that. But it's like the, the stadiums in England, you might get like... The Yokao is the main promotion. Guy called Brian Calder, a friend of mine. He's a Glasgow guy. From, he, like, yeah. from Glasgow, yeah. yeah, yeah. He's the main promoter in uh, the UK. Mm-hmm. Um, he does all his shows in England, but he's, he's Scottish. They, he might get 5,000 in, in there. It, it's not That's like, a lot, yeah, It's a lot for Thai walks in, yeah. It is a lot. And they're the best shows in the country by a mile. Mm-hmm. The atmosphere, the fight, it is, it is brilliant. But obviously, like what Josh is getting, he's filling the arena out. He's got so many of the Leeds fans behind him and stuff. And yeah. they're like the best fans in the world. We said earlier, when he goes to Vegas, we'll all go. Yeah. 100%. He's next level, Josh, as well, man. I'm rooting for him. Rooting for yourself as yeah. well, man. Everybody I've met from Leeds are sound as fuck. They're crazy bastards <laughs> and the Leeds fans are fucking crazy. But No fans <laughs> in the world like the Leeds fans, mate. 100%. Yeah, these are nuts. Um, <laughs> so going forward then, through all that, I know you're trying to hang on for the next three years to get world title shots, all that stuff. How have you been going through lockdown? I struggled a little bit to be honest because the, like I said there were um, that void there that I just couldn't f- couldn't fill and fighting is a drug that nothing else on earth can compare to and uh, I missed it and I, I, I was a little, bit, a little bit down at some points and I probably did my missus I didn't like moping around the house and stuff but I was lucky like I had other stuff to keep me busy like we mentioned before the clothing um, my training website Liam Harrison training and stuff like that they've all done really well and um, I'm financially in best place I've probably ever been but even with that like money isn't everything you got to do what makes you happy and nothing makes me happy over like fighting does yeah. like I said it is a, a drug mate it, honestly nothing can compare to getting your hand raised at the end nothing can compare to what you go through in fight camp especially when other fighters in gym are in fight camp and stuff as well the buzz 
everything about it. I, I, I've just missed it. And yeah. um, I'm glad we're getting into back a bit of routine now, just so we Are can- Are you scared to retire? I am. I am, mate, I won't lie to you. I thought about it a few times and uh, it's- I don't, I, honestly, I worry for my missus because she'll be one looking after me and nurse, <laughs> nursing me back yeah. to, to some sort of like mental yeah. mental health. But you've but been doing that over 20 years, staying in gyms, working hard, producing the goods, becoming world champion. It's a phenomenal career. So obviously you don't want to let it go. It's a big void of your life. That is like, it's a healthy addiction. It is an obsession. Massively. I, I am obsessed with this mm. sport. I'm obsessed with the lifestyle. I'm obsessed with training. I'm obsessed with fighting i'm obsessed with wanting to like push myself and stay at this top level and like i said earlier i'll know when it's time to let go from the top level well, you know though would you would you have when too these much young kids I, i'm st like my last four or five wins have all been against young up-and-coming kids who are good fighters and they're all trying to make a name for themselves and i've slapped them all back into place <laughs> when it's time uh, for, when when that when i lose mm -hmm. these fights where i should like that what i should win mm -hmm. i'll think you know what that this wouldn't have happened a few years ago yeah. i'll know to because i don't want to embarrass myself yeah. i don't want to be one of these guys who goes on for too long who, who just lets it go too long you lose your legacy you lose your reputation you lose everything you've worked for and i've seen it happen to a lot of guys and there's a lot of guys out there still doing it and i think oh what's he doing just yeah. retire just you can't need money that bad what is the age normally for thai fighters and muay thai to quit in thailand because they, by the time these are like 25 year old they've had 300 fights they've been serious mate I remember right, my 100th fight in England, everyone made a big deal out of it because I think there's only two of us in England who've had 100 fights. It's me and I think Iman Barlow, a female fighter. Everyone made a big deal out of it. And my opponent were a Thai from Thailand called Singdam. And they asked him in the interview, said, so Westerner, you're fighting, is this 100th fight? What do you think about that? And he went, I had 100 fights when I was 15. <laughs> so so that's what he's fighting that's basically he, every day. That's what his reply was. And I was like, oh, I feel yeah. really, really shit about myself yeah. now. Cheers, mate. Uh -huh. But yeah. So again, yeah, it's difficult because you see boxers coming back in their 40s. If you want to retire, then I think it's okay. You hang up the gloves kind of then. But are you struggling with the, the mental health side of it, being fit all the time? And then you're getting those natural chemicals, your serotonin, endorphins, the dopamine, all the healthy chemicals that make you feel good. When you're not training, do you slump and feel depressed kind of I thing? I slump, mate. I feel like shit. Like, what happened at the first lockdown war? I fought the week before the lockdown happened, and that's when I'd split my shins. What happened with that? that I got a botch job done in the, by the paramedics afterwards. It was fucking disgraceful what they did to me. They glued my shins up terribly, strapped them all up and said, right, don't get them wet for six days. Don't take the dressing off for six days. After six days, I took the dressing off. You can watch, look at this on my Instagram. I, I put a, a photo up of it about three, four days ago. I took the dressing off and the wounds were just wide open still. I went to the hospital and they, they said to me, this is the worst glue job we've ever seen. So they had to scrape all the fucking glue out without no anaesthetic or anything. It was horrendous pain. They scraped it all out, steri stripped it, put it back and said, right, you're, gonna be, you're not going to be able to do it here for about a good month. So the lockdown happened, I couldn't run, I couldn't do any sort of training. I was just sat around for a month and then the lockdown just kept continuing. Both my legs got then got infected, so I had to keep going back to hospital and getting tablets and stuff and um, antibiotics. So by that time that happened, I put weight on, I was just sat around, I looked at myself in the mirror, I gone, fucking hell. Six, well, eight week ago, you just had a fight, you were ripped to death, you are in great shape, you are on a good winning spree. Now look at you, well, you've that shit, you've let your send go, couldn't go to the gym. I just, honestly, I was de depressed as fuck. And obviously I had like my, my clothing brand and my, my website and stuff like that to work on. And I'm glad that I did have the time to work on those these things and because they have gone really well. But in between doing that, I just couldn't stop thinking about fighting and I was wanting to train. I wanted to go run, but I couldn't because of my legs. And by the time I'd all healed up and then by the time the gyms opened back up, it took me, I felt like I was starting from scratch again and yeah. I'm going to work my way back up mm -hmm. but it's good that you're getting your clothing brand in place now like if you know you're maybe coming to an end in three years mm. it's good to have these things in place because by the sounds of it you need to keep busy yeah or else I'd admit yeah, it'll be, it's uh, honestly mate, I'll, I'll, I'll be in very very big I mean? trouble if I ain't got something yeah. to I, I get obsessed with stuff and um, that's why Thai boxing has been so, like when I used to play football I wanted to be the best in the team I wanted to be the best if I was just like an average player I probably wouldn't have done it I get obsessed with wanting to to be the best. Mm -hmm. And then I obviously had the, the scouts watching me when I was younger and stuff, but then Thai boxing came along and I got obsessed with wanting to be 
not just like the best in the gym, just the best that I could be. And I wanted to fight the best. And I used to just walk around daydreaming about being the best at it. Yeah. And um, I get like that. So hopefully when that day does come and I have to retire, mm. um, I've got the clothing, I've got my website. And because I, I want to be the best coach, my training website, it, it, that's flying. I've got like 13,000 members worldwide on that, which is like a really good number. And I want to be like known as one of the best coaches as well as, the best, the best fighter because mm -hmm. there's not many who are doing both at the minute. I've, yeah. I've like, there's not many who do as many seminars as me who also fight at this top level, who also got time to train other fighters and stuff. So when that goes, I'll just put all my energy into coaching, I reckon. Yeah. Um, but at least I'll have the clothing brand. and yeah. Other things to work on. Yeah, yeah. What's a seminar? What do, what do you mean when you do a seminar? So basically other gyms, just they will pay me to go to their gym and just do, it's like usually two hours and I will just teach all the, my favourite techniques, which I, I use when I fight, when I train, just to help me get to, to that level. It's all my favourite techniques, it's like Liam Harrison style Muay Thai, basically. How many techniques are there in Muay Thai? <sighs> I've been training 22 years and I still learn every day, mate. Um, yeah. yeah, there's, there's obviously there's, it's called the science of eight limbs. So you can kick, you can punch, you can knee, you can elbow. Then there's the old, the clinch work, which is an art form in itself. Because if you can't clinch, you can be as good as you want outside the clinch. But if some Thai champion comes and grabs you around your neck and you can't clinch, you are going to be fucked. Because they are so strong and they are so like, it's a, a completely different artwork, art form itself. There's so much different stuff going on that, like inside the clinch that just to stop them clinching or to stop yourself getting elbowed or to stop yourself getting thrown on the floor. And it's so tiring. Obviously like the, the MMA guys with the wrestling. The judo and stuff Yeah, as well. the, the jujitsu and stuff like yeah. that. If you've ever done anything like that, you know how tiring it is like locking on and grappling with someone else. So that is like one of the, the main things. It'll take you years to, to get good at just clinch work on its own. Mm. Then there's all the sweeps. Then there's the throws. Then there's... It's also, endless. endless endless yeah. so is it tiring do you go home tired after a heavy workout yeah it's it's exhausting on your body like that's why like the looking after yourself like now I've got a bit older comes massively important into it because not only am I doing all this I'm doing my strength and conditioning and stuff as well and um, the explosive weighted stuff got to go to run to keep my weight down the pad work the kicks the sparring it's it's a lot of, your body's not meant to take all this yeah, shit, you yeah, know what yeah. I mean? Mm -hmm. So yeah, I go home like physically, physically exhausted some nights. Where's the best place in the world to fight? Where would you love to fight before uh, in the next three years? Where's the place that stands out to you? I'd love to fight in Vegas. Yeah. I'd love to, yeah. Do they yeah. have fights in Vegas? Yeah, they do, yeah. Um, they do, I think Fremont Street, they do it. No, Fremont Street, the big strip. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They have outdoor shows mm -hmm. there. I'd have loved to have fought there, but... One championship who I'm signed to now, they're going to America, I think, over in the next couple of years. So as long as they get the foot down and get over there before yeah. I'm too old, that'd be... Yeah. I'd, yeah, I'd love to fight in Vegas, Vegas, mate. But the only thing I worry about that is I'd probably just fucking spunk on me fight wage as soon as I got out of the <laughs> ring, mate. I'd, I'd have yeah. no to show for it. And Mrs. <laughs> wouldn't be happy. Yeah. So amazing career. Everybody knows your name in the fight industry. Plans for the future going forward. I know you've got your clothing brand you want to do. Would you ever have a, your own gym? we spoke about this earlier didn't yeah. we again for someone like this I think there'll be so much pressure on me because of how well my career's done to yeah. to produce my own fighters I'm not sure how I'd feel about that um, I love my teaching my seminars and I love like being a freelance fighter if I have my own gym I do a lot of seminar tours abroad so I do America regular so I can just go out there and go for two three weeks and I'll go around all different gyms there if I have my own gym I won't be able to just get up and leave and go to America for free week uh -huh. and I, I need someone running it. I need to, I'm not sure I'd trust anyone running it of, because like I say, I get obsessed with stuff and I'm a perfectionist. I, when I'm training, I make sure everything's done properly. I train hard. I'd want all my fighters doing that. If I left them for three weeks at a time and stuff and they want doing that and I came back and it wasn't how I want, liked it or how I wanted it, I, I don't think I could, I don't know, it's just a tough thing. Yeah. I'd never say never, but I love doing my seminar tours. I love being freelance, but we'll see. You never know. Yeah. What's your best knockout you've ever had? Ooh, uh, I've had 48 in my career. So I've had quite a few good ones. <laughs> but, um, but I'm, renowned for, I'm renowned for hard punches and hard leg kicks. So the, I did a, a really spectacular one on one championship last January. Um, I dropped him with a left duck and then I, I dropped him with an elbow and he probably should have got waved off and then it was really poor refereeing to be honest because I dropped him again afterwards and he were out for about five or ten minutes but that were a good and I've had a lot with leg kicks I'm renowned for stopping people with my leg kicks I fought 
a guy called Andre Colbin about six years ago, 18 times world champion he was. Um, he had, I was fighting at 63 kilo at the time. He was fighting at 67. He'd come to England twice and he'd knocked out the number one and two at the weight above me. And then when I got matched with him, everyone wrote me off and said, that guy's too big. He said, he's too big, he'll beat Liam. And everyone wrote me off and that fucking, it gave me so much like fucking motivation that. Mm. And I told everyone in the, the pre-fight interviews and everything, I said, I'm going to stop him. I said, watch me stop him. And I stopped him with leg kicks and uh, that's on YouTube. You can watch that one. I, it, I absolutely yeah. fucking tenderized his Does leg. It, you get excited knocking someone out. Is that a throw for you? Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I, love, I love to fight. I love to fight. Um, <laughs> it's like a fucking license to kill, basically, Muay Thai, though, isn't it? Yeah, that, that, like I say, I love, I love to fight and I love to be involved in life. If you've seen any of my clips on my Instagrams, I always fight hard and I love to get involved in wars and stuff like that. There's no fucking better feeling. I've come out of the ring sometimes against some of the best fighters in the world when I've lost with my face covered in blood, but it's been an exciting fight and the fans have loved it. And that's what I fucking buzz on. I see myself as like an, an entertainer, a gladiator. Yeah. Like as long as the fans are happy, I not win, lose or draw, whether I'm the main event or whether I'm just fighting on the undercard, I want everyone to come out of that arena and go, fucking hell, Liam Harrison's fight. Oh, just, yeah. can, you, can you believe how good that fight was? People come to see me fight because I want to see a war or I want to see someone get knocked out. Um, and that's what I that at this stage of my career, when I've done everything that I wanted to do now, I want to make sh the last half, first half of my career for me, the last half is for the fans. Everyone who pays money for a ticket, everyone who stays to watch me fight when I'm fighting abroad, everyone who gets the app to watch it, who stays up late when I'm in another country, this is for them now. I want it to be exciting for them. I want it to be exciting for everyone who's paying money for a ticket and stuff. That's what I, yeah. I want to do. I want to be an entertainer. What's been your own worst knockout? Uh, I've only been ever been stopped once to the head and that were against that fucking giant who elbowed me head oh, off. Was that? Yeah, yeah. Oh. That, that my own stupid fault. I shouldn't have, it were on a two weeks notice. It were in December as well. So I've been on fucking piss because I thought Christmas was coming up. I wasn't really fit. And they just rang me and said, oh, do you want to fight? I said, I won't make weight. And they went, no. It's uh, the weight above. And then, Would you fight anybody, anytime, I've, anywhere? I've, that's what I've done my whole career. I've never dodged anyone. I've fought the, the greatest fighter of this generation. He's called Sanchai. He's the Floyd Mayweather of Thai boxing. I fought him three times. Um, I lost some points three times, but every fight has been a really close, hard fought fight. And there's no one else at the box but back to fighting three times. So it, that in itself is an achievement to be, because this guy's next level. He's, he's unbelievable. In Thailand, about seven or eight years ago, he had a two-on-one fight. They got two other Thai champions and he fought them both at the same time. So one of them fought the first two rounds and then the last three rounds, a fresh one came in and he beat them. So to like to fight guys like that, then I think- How does people like him get treated in Thailand? Like royalty? He's a god. Yeah. Is he? Mm. He's an absolute god. He's a god worldwide. Um, he's on a, I think a 58 streak winning fight, winning streak at the minute, 58 fights in a row. And in Thai boxing, to go that many fights in a row and beaten, it's unheard of because there's so many ways to lose. Like I said, there's the clinch work, there's punches, there's elbows, you could get cut, you could injure yourself. There's so many different ways to lose in Muay Thai. But to go 58 fights unbeaten, it's it's unheard of and that's what he's on at the minute and he's 41. Could you fight him again? I train with him now. Do you? Uh, yeah, so whenever Where I go- it over there? Yeah, he's in Yokao, this, uh -huh. this gym here, Yokao gym. So whenever I um, go to Thailand, that's my gym I train at. So I usually go there two or three times a year. If you fight him again, I'm coming to yeah. watch that. <laughs> <Is> that <laughs> you know what? We, we spar in the gym now and it's obviously, we've fought three times, mm -hmm. so we know each other anyway, but I still, I still can't work him out. He's a fucking genius, mate. He's, he? he's like, he will know what you're going to do before you know what you're going to do. He's two steps ahead mm -hmm. of everything. Um, I put a clip up of me on my Instagram of me and him fighting yesterday and it were a, the second fight we had, I, I wobbled him and I cut him with an elbow and at round four, he went a bit grey and I thought, fucking hell, I've got fruit in me, I'm going to stop him. And then round five, he went back to his corner, came back out and he just fucked me up. I'm thinking, eh, I had him. Yeah. Then he was, he was grey. I thought, I'm gonna, I thought he had him and then uh, he just brought another gear out. That's what makes those champions though, aren't the, it? The ties, mate, the, the, the ties, they, they are different. They are built different. They've been doing it since we were six year old. They've been on a good diet since we were six year old. They've fought every different style. They've had 300 fights. And um, when you've got someone like him, who's so evasive, so tricky, it's, it's yeah, yeah, next level. Does that, is that one thing that does annoy you that you never beat him? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because does he ever annoy you? Does he throw it in your face? Yeah, when we're over in there in Thailand, he takes the piss out of me and stuff like <laughs> he don't have. Um, 
But he said after the fight, he said that was, from all the Westerners he fought, he said, I was the toughest fight, which is, that's nice to hear, yeah. especially from someone like him. Yeah, he was a win. Yeah. Bat, doesn't yeah, that? a little yeah, bit, yeah, yeah. yeah. Fuck on me. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's the thing, even when we're sparring now, I think, right, I'll get a little bit of my own back here and then he'll just fucking sling me on the floor yeah. or something as well. Yeah. So you're coming, it's three years left, brother. Like I said before, amazing career. You've got things planned for the future. Are you in a good place now? Feeling yeah. good? Yeah, I'm back in the gym now with... Um, the other fighters are all back as well. We've got a bit of routine going. Obviously, lockdown's fucked that up a little bit, but all the fighters are back and we've back. Everyone's got the same goals again now. Start of lockdown, everyone like gone off thinking, oh, this is shit. There were no routine. Everyone were off doing their own thing and stuff. New Year's started now. We've got all the best fighters back in the gym. Everyone's working hard. Everyone's getting a bit of a buzz back again. Yeah. We've got fighters who haven't fought for two or three years, top level guys like Jordan Watson. Um, he's one of the best fighters this country's ever seen. He's my one of my best friends, my training partner. He's back in the gym now and he's like got a buzz about it. And I love it when he's got a buzz because when me and him were coming up through the ranks together, we used to train together every day. And if he started getting a little bit fitter than me, I didn't like it. So I had to work harder. Yeah. And if I started getting a bit fitter than him, he didn't like it. So he'd work harder. Pushing each other. And me and him bounce off each other yeah. like that. If he's getting fitter, it makes me work harder. If yeah. I'm getting fitter, he'll work harder. So for to have that buzz back again, it's uh, it's good and I feel I feel hungry yeah. again. Because a lot of people will be struggling now, so a lot of people will be looking at you for inspiration, mm -hmm. motivation to keep going. So if you're battling, it shows people that we're all human at the end of the day exactly people will be looking at you think you've got it sussed out and life will be great world champions belts traveling the world everybody loves you in the fight industry and if yeah if you're battling then it goes to show that wait a minute man it's okay to fucking yeah. battle everyone's got demons yeah. everyone's got stuff going on and everyone's got like their outlet to everyone sees mine because i've got a lot of followers on instagram and stuff like everyone sees what my outlet is it's me fucking coming in this gym smashing the pad smashing the bag you don't see what goes on behind Instagram. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? When I was sat in my house, fucking devastated in this lockdown and stuff like that. Um, having to speak to my friends, uh, my friend school, who was out there having to speak to him about anxiety and stuff like that because I started thinking, right, is my career over here? Is it done? Is this it done? Am I not going to get me sent back to full fitness? Will I ever fight again? Will we ever have shows in England again? It, it, was, it, were, it were tough, do you know what I mean? Everyone, it's hard to, if anyone's having any problems with anything, just speak to your friends, yeah. talk to your friends. That was the best thing I did because I was sat in yeah. my house and I were, I were worried at, at some points and I went out for a meal with my missus and I'm only, I'm only told about three people this. I went out for a meal with my missus and I was sat there and I said, we need to go. She said, why? My food wouldn't even come yet. I, mean, I just had like a fucking mini panic attack because all I've been thinking about all that day was, and my career's done, I can't fight, I can't train. And my food got put in front of me. I had to get, I said, we need to go. We had to get up and I had to go home. And it's fucking locking myself in my bedroom and just lie there in darkness for like two hours just till I came back down. And yeah. It were awful, mate. Yeah. And I, I've never experienced all like that. Mm -hmm. So if I'm experiencing stuff like that, what are all these poor people who are like losing their businesses and stuff to this shit that's going on? Yeah. Do you know what I mean? What's going on with these guys? Mm -hmm. So yeah, if you have got any problems, just talk to someone, yeah. speak to your friends, let it out. But I think as well, you think you've gave yourself three years. So you're probably thinking, I've just lost I, a year. I feel like I'm being robbed, mate. Yeah, I feel like, the, yeah, yeah. especially because I'm in, the rest of the probably done your world a good though. Yeah. The thing is, because I were in such good form as well and I was winning and I'd won my last, I think three of them by KO, won my five of my last six or something and I were on good form and I was getting myself in line for a title, another title shot and I felt like they just stole it away from me. But obviously, there's bigger things going on than this. There's people who are losing businesses and stuff like that. So everything's losing somewhere in this time. Yeah. So yeah, it's just got to try and stay on yeah. top of it and try and look towards the positives. And Exactly, man. And keep pushing forward. The exercise is key. key. Always key. Yeah, exercise is key. See, when you see kids fighting and stuff, do you know straight away they've got a talent? Yeah. But the worst thing is, I'll tell you what's the worst thing. When you see someone come through this door in this gym who has got all the talent in the world, but won't put that work in. Because... When I were coming up through the ranks and stuff, I, my technique wasn't the best until I were about five or six years into my career. I was just raw, but I worked harder than anyone else. I knew there were a lot of fighters out there who were technically better than me, but I just thought, well, if you're technically better than me, fuck this, you won't work harder than me. Yeah. I'll make sure I'm fitter. I'll make sure I'm, I can go five rounds at a faster pace than you. I'll make sure that I'm stronger. I'll make sure that I run more miles than you. I'll make sure I do more rounds on the pads than you. And eventually, when I started going to Thailand and work with different trainers, my technique started to come with it and I started to, to get a bit of a technical style as well as the power and aggressive style. But that's the worst thing when you see a young fighter come through the door and they've got all the talent in the world, but they'll just be lazy or they won't work hard. You can teach everything, but you can't teach desire. You can't teach discipline and you can't teach heart. You've either got it 
or you want and you either want it or you don't yeah discipline is key as well yeah. man for any kids watching that are up and coming train hard I know there's a lot of boys in Glasgow now training hard a lot of, in fact some of the kids that I've seen some of their fights man they're tough tough boys but this is the breaking point in it where if you're going through lockdown and shit people think is, are they going to have to find another career path what advice would you give for any up and coming fighters stick with it do not let anyone tell you that you can't do this because I remember when I were in school I remember I got sent out of English, I was 15, and Mr. Hill, he said to me, when I got sent out, he said, what do you think you're going to do with your life? He said, do you think you're going to be a professional fighter? Because I'll tell you now, that's not going to happen. And I remember thinking at the time, thinking, fuck you. I thought, I will show you. So if you're watching Mr. Hill, <laughs> 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 don't let anyone tell you that you can't do it. Mm -hmm. Stay obsessed, be disciplined, and just stick with it and trust the process. As long as you are putting the work in and you are grafting as hard as physically possible, the universe will repay you. Yeah, definitely. I honestly believe that. Mm -hmm. well, you're living proof of it, but hard work is key, like you says there. Train harder than everybody else. Believe in yourself is yeah. key as well. When, when Mr. Hull's telling you, you can't <laughs> do that. And, and well, I'll never forget that, mate. I remember at the time, you thinking, I just wanted to go, I just wanted to say it at the time, mm -hmm. go, fuck you. Mm -hmm. I said it in my head and I thought, right, I'll show you. Yeah. <laughs> but for coming on today, brother, and telling your story, would you like to finish up on anything yourself? I um, just want to say a massive thank you to everyone who supported me in my career, all my sponsors. Um, Jim King, my clothing brand, 11th Commandment, stuff like that. All my trainers, all my training partners, my gyms in England and Thailand. Just a massive thank you to everyone. Yeah. Uh, mainly to all my friends and family and my fans who have supported me in my career because without them, without the support, without them buying the tickets and stuff like that to, to come and support me when I was coming up from my career, I won't be where I am now. Yeah. Coming on today, brother, and telling yeah, your story, massive mate. Massive thank you. Thank yeah, you very thank much. Thank you. And I look forward to seeing your next fight. Cheers, mate. Cheers, brother. Thank you. Check out more of my podcasts on the right and be sure to like, share and comment your thoughts on this week's podcast. Thank you.